This section, dear friends, talks about the language of worship. It talks about the language of sound and silence, meaning language of music, language of space, vesture, movement, meaning posture, gestures, and procession. Talking about sound and silence, music. Speech, music, and silence are the predominant verbal languages of worship employed in the liturgy of the hours. In our day, many communities of worship employ the spoken word for their prayer. Music speaks that which lies in the depth of our, the text, but also in the depth of our lives, but exceeds the capacity of its own words that express it. When we use the language of music, we express that which is in our hearts that cannot be easily expressed in words. It is expressed in emotions in the language of music. Several elements of the hours are by nature forms of prayer intended to be sung. It's just enough, uh, for example, talk about the hymn, the psalms, the antiphons. Just by nature, they are meant to be sung. As far as possible, hymns should be sung in community celebrations as their nature demands. This is taken from the General Instruction Religion of the Hours number 280. The psalms especially should be sung whenever possible. Many communities deprive themselves unnecessarily of the depth of meaning that emerges from the Psalms when they do not respect the Psalms' intrinsic musical character. For example, the Psalms are characterized with strophes of three, with strophes of four lines, with strophes of two lines, and this has to be expressed respected as much as possible when we are singing or even when we are reciting. But even when we are singing and there are two choirs involved, one choir listens as the other sings. But it listens and, the, and prays with the words. This is to avoid putting everything at once, especially when the psalm is long, and that it weighs too much of the person who is praying, that it becomes too heavy. That's why we listen as, and pray as another one is singing and edifying our hearts through the beautiful voices. And as the other also listens, we sing and we edify our gifts and offer it to the hearts and minds and ears of the other choir. The practice of singing the Psalms to simple chants is the land gives one the opportunity to dwell on the words and allow them to penetrate one's heart in a way that is not possible when they are just said. When the words are just said, the, the, the word of God may not sink too much into the hearts of the other person as when it is sung. When it is sung, it has a double impact because it's beautiful to hear the voices. At the same time, the word of God is repeats and catches the mind and the heart as it repeats in the person's life. On a festive occasion, a community that customarily sings the psalms to simple tones may want to sing one of the great hymns of praise found among both psalms and canticles to more elaborate singing or setting. For example, the gospel canticles of Zachariah, the Benedictus of the Magnificat, that is the cantic of Mary, of Simeon, are particularly well suited for the song because even their solemn, their, their solemn canticles because they are taken also from the gospels, the word of God, the gospel of Luke especially. Antiphons and responsories to readings are short refrains which when sung to the appealing melodies can become like the refrains of familiar hymns, accompaniments to the day's activities, evoking the repeated return to prayer that in the basis for prayer without ceasing. So the prayer without ceasing, just imagine a, a simple melody, a simple tune that was repeated. It, it captures the heart and that accompanies me throughout the day, especially when they are sung. Some or all the other verbal elements of the hours, such as the call to worship, O oh God, come to her aid, Lord, open her lips, the intercessions, the Lord's prayer, the concluding prayer, and the blessing, may be selected for singing according to the principle of progressive solemnity, which the solemnity, on the solemn occasions, it's beautiful to sing most of the parts. On feasts, great number of the parts. On memorials, a few parts. On ordinary days, a simple, maybe one or two psalms, depending, so that that progressive solemnity is uh, kept in mind, so that we don't sing solemnly on ordinary days, and then on solemnity we recite everything. This is what this principle of, sol of progressive solemnity means. Since it takes 
practical, particular musical skills to sing a reading in such a way that it can be clearly understood by the hearers. Readings might best be sung on only the most solemn occasions if appropriate melodies and the suitable skilled reader are available. Like readings themselves, the first reading, second reading, the response of psalm, and then the gospel especially on solemn occasions. The language of silence. The alternation of song, speech, and silence is an important aspect of any liturgical celebration, including the liturgy of the hours. Short periods of silence offer participants the opportunity to allow some texts and readings of the Word of God to penetrate more deeply. For example, when there's a silence, it allows what we have prayed before to really sink into our hearts than when we rush things. Care should be taken, however, that silence not overweigh the Word of God in such a way as to disrupt the rhythm of the hour. Every hour has a rhythm. So it's a silence that should not be exaggerated. Space, vesture, and movement. Every aspect of a liturgical celebration contributes to the expression and deepening of the core relationship of God to the community brought to completion in the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, of a God who wanted to be close to the community. The Word of God is an essential element of the liturgy of the hours, but it does not stand alone as a sole bearer of the meeting in time between God and humanity in an awesome dialogue of prayer. That's why we have the languages of worship, which are visual, verbal, oral, or non-verbal. They include the physical environment and the assembly's movement within it. It is as spirit embodied that we participate in the passage from death to resurrection in Jesus Christ, thanks to the verbal languages and thanks to the non-verbal languages. Therefore, it is an embodied spirit, a spirit with the body, that we must participate in the liturgical celebrations of that passage from, uh, from, uh, from the daily life to the eternal life, thank, uh, the eternal life of God revealed in Christ. The full and active participation to which the Vatican II exhorts us Sacrosanctum Concilium number 14, must use more of these body languages than only speech and song. Means both verbal and nonverbal symbolic languages. Dear friends, we use these visible body languages to take us to the invisible reality of a God who revealed himself in the person of Christ, who made himself visible. So that's why we need the visible languages to remind us of the invisible language, that's what, uh, the uh, realities. That's why we talk about the verbal languages and the nonverbal languages to lead us into the invisible uh, reality. Space. Because the hours belong to every Christian community, the hours are prayed in a very, every, every kind of space, everywhere we can pray the hours, from living room to the meeting room to the cathedral to the parishes and so on and so forth. The hours are grounded in the presence of Christ in the assembly. So the hours are prayed in the assembly and in the word of God, prayed and proclaimed of how God is, uh, is present in the word of God. The reality of Christ's presence is realized in every assembly, large and small. We're talking about the space here. Therefore, participants should make every effort to seat themselves in groups or choirs so that they can hear one another clearly and in unison of heart and mind through the unison of each other's voice. That's why there's no need to rush things. One is singing ahead of the other. No, we, as we sing, we listen to the other. As we listen to the other, we sing so that we move together, which shows a sign of unity of the assembly praying together. The quality of light speaks with a special eloquence on this passage from night to day. In a church, the lighting of the Easter candle always recalls the presence of the one in whose resurrection light triumphs over darkness, our Lord, who comes into darkness. The Easter candle is particularly appropriate on Sundays and throughout the Easter season, but it may be done at any other time, especially for the evening prayer. In other settings, candles of any kind may serve a similar function, which reminds us of Christ as a symbol of light which, who comes to warm our hearts and uh, our lives. The offering of incense also evokes the Paschal victory of Christ. Pray, uh, incense is recording the prayer that rises to heaven, like just enough to remember the sacrifice of, of, uh, of Abel. A particular environment may call for 
other stationary elements that serve for the celebration. For example, the cross, the icon, especially of our Lord, the flowers, uh, but all with simplicity uh, so that there's a taste in such a way that they draw attention to the presence of Christ in prayer rather than distracting it. Vesture. Clothing can serve effectively as one of the silent languages of worship, the way we dress. The vesture worn by ministers should be appropriate to the place and the solemnity of the hour being celebrated. For example, the evening prayer on the anniversary or dedication of the parish church may have a special character of the, celebra of the celebration by dressing in clothes uh, that they wear on Sunday Mass, for example, because Sunday is a solemnity. If the celebration takes place in the cathedral or parish church, a priest wears alb, stall, or a desired cup, like the one we use for the adoration. A deacon vests in alb and stall and may also wear a dalmatic. Other ministers dress according to the local custom, and if desired, they may wear an alb or liturgical vesture for a proper, uh, which are proper to the ministers. The criteria is that of simplicity, dignity, beauty, without exaggerations, dear friends. Movement. The environment for worship largely determines the nature and extent for the assembly's movement. A large form of church or chapel requires that ministers stand or in turn or read, lest their voices be lost among the furniture. That's why we have to stand in order to respect the word of God, but also to be heard. A small, info, a small informal room may make frequent standing and kneeling uncomfortable and impractical, and it may render a, pro, a procession even absurd. Therefore, worshippers are to be encouraged to pray with their entire body, mind, heart, and soul, the entire being, within the given space, whatever that may be. And they have to look at what is around in order to adjust. Through appropriate and designated movements, the body helps to keep the mind and heart attuned to the voice of God in the liturgy of the hours. That's why whatever movements of the body should be able to help us to pray better. Posture. Postures already familiar from the Eucharist celebration can serve equally well also to the liturgy of the hours. For example, the assembly stands together for the call to worship or God come to our aid and to draw open him. For the proclamation of the gospel, they stand. When it is read and when it is sung, when they, they sang the gospel cantico as well, especially the canticles of, of Benedictus, Magnificat, and Nunc Dimittis. For the intercessions, the, uh, the assembly stands. The Lord's Prayer, the assembly stands. It's good also to sing the Lord's Prayer, by the way. For the concluding prayer and the blessing, for the closing hymn and that night prayer, the assembly stands. And the assembly seats, for example, for the reading, so that they are comfortable and they are able to read, and other, gospel, um, and, uh, other than at the gospel. And for the psalmody, the psalmody we said is especially the psalms and the canticles. Here, a certain variety of posture serves to express the character of a particular psalm. For example, the community might sit for most of the psalms, but stand for the psalm of praise at the end of the psalmody of morning prayer, or kneel for the penitential psalm, like Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, during Lent. These are all creativities that could be there. Kneeling at other moments, such as intercessions, is another appropriate way of marking Lent in contrast to Easter season when standing points to the resurrection. It is also advantageous for ministers to stand whenever they are exercising their particular role in order to focus on the assembly's attention, as well as to ensure that all can see and hear clearly. Appropriate movement on the part of the ministers also serves practically to break up any potential monotony. Gesture. Even in the restricted space, members of the assembly may want to make use of the traditional gestures belonging to the hours. It is customary for all present to make the sign of the cross three times as the ordinary means for beginning the prayer, a call to worship, God come to our aid, as a mark of reverence towards the gospel uh, at the beginning of the cantico, as a way of appropriate final blessing, the mighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we talk about the incense, for example, here, the incense bearer and the tradition uh, and the assembly traditional bow to one another before and after incensing the people. So another gesture of bowing. Processions, we remind us that we are all pilgrims, dear friends. And that's why we have the entrance procession and the final procession, uh, which are also part of it. Other procession can be like on the barrio and on an anniversary where people move around incensing the church. 
God bless you.